j'espère que vous êtes bien rafraîchis euh, et pour éviter que tout le monde euh, s'endorme un peu, on vous a prévu euh, un petit passage euh, publicitaire, un petit message euh, d'un sponsor, sans qui euh, ce séminaire n'aurait pas lieu. Euh, Athènes, donc une petite vidéo juste pour vous faire voyager un peu dans cette après-midi. de l'Université Combino, euh, qui va nous présenter donc, une première vision sur les espèces marines introduites en Polynésie. Très bien, merci. Et après, je veux parler en anglais parce que pour moi, c'est plus facile que je rappelle vraiment. Et pour moi, c'était une surprise parce que je savais que je pouvais parler de tout le monde là. Et on m'a dit que ça devrait être fait dans 8 minutes. Alors, ça va être rapide, pas trop vite. Et très bien. Alors, on commence. Uh, it's uh, what uh, has been seen already this morning, thanks to all the presentation. It's uh, evidence of uh, enormous maritime traffic uh, everywhere, of course, near the ocean, but also around French Polynesia, and uh, you can see that uh, our friend. French Polynesia, there are many uh, ships uh, in pink that are, uh, there is a high concentration of pink ships. This uh, corresponds to uh, yesterday before, the day before yesterday. Uh, they are pleasure crafts. Craft. Well, from uh, high maritime traffic and uh, being located here with uh, receiving a lot of vessels uh, of different regions, we expected uh, exotic species, exotic species, non-indigenous species, or this to abbreviate. Um, and uh, we were looking for them using different uh, tools First, uh, we started in 2011 uh, with uh, physical monitoring, I mean, uh, getting the individuals and confirming them from DNA barcoding. And uh, later, uh, we went later and we used the eDNA sample part of the same sites. Uh, in different ports, and uh, we found 75 uh, non-indigenous species in total. Uh, between the, the proportion was between 11% uh, in the, let's say, most valuable uh, port, small port of Congo in Morea, to uh, this was the maximum, and the minimum was 3% in the remote control of Rangiroa in the port of Triputa. So we found that under this uh, invasive species, I mean species that have been cataloged by as invasive uh, by the International Journal of Conservation for the Nature and in different databases. So even in remote atolls, we start uh, finding invasive species. How are the indigenous species here in French Polynesia? Well, uh, 
observation is that the, the aliens are normally less diverse than native ones, and especially as expected also in ports with less maritime traffic because it's more fun, they get less traffic so they get less species from different areas. Uh, analyzing the different uh, types of organisms and classifying them as uh, primary producers, which are basically algae, but uh, macro and micro algae, and the uh, heterotrophs, which uh, are animals, briefly. We, uh, and from each group, something that can be seen directly is that uh, we find that a lot of, uh, we found a lot of uh, rhodopita, which are red algae, and the uh, mollusks. Mm, and uh, in green are native species, in yellow are exotic niche species, and uh, in red are those species that are catalogued as invasive. We can see here that uh, um, we, we found uh, like problematic uh, groups, especially red algae, but we found uh, a lot of niche there and uh, also mollusks. Uh, the two types of organisms uh, are transported by ships, uh, are part important part of the biofueling, and uh, uh, are also transported in balanced water, the larvae and the propagus of the algae. So the question is, uh, will Polynesian ecosystems become algae-rich following Hawaii samples, for example? They have uh, some bad examples of uh, invasion by Ukema, uh, for example, or as you have the problem you have in New Zealand with Oyerpa, who knows? It's, uh, they are there, but uh, they are there. Are they many, little, big population, small population? Uh, so we got problematic species or just uh, yeah, like new kids in the club, like uh, newcomers and uh, wandering around. So only one example to try to fit the eight minutes, <laughs> the oyster case. Here we found the natal rock oyster, Sacostrea piculata, which, which is native to the Indian Ocean and to the Red Sea. And the formed oyster Metostrea frongs, which is native to the Caribbean Sea. These two species are cataloged as invasive species, and there are documented invasions in the Mediterranean Sea of the two of them. <coughs> we have seen them not only from environmental DNA, but also physically. And we have barcoded uh, many individuals of those species, so we can be sure they are here. And uh, we found a significant increase in only seven years. In 2011 and 11, we found uh, uh, in blue the Nostrea fronts, in uh, orange uh, Sacostrea cuculata, and uh, we found them uh, only in one island, or in Morea or in Tahiti, and in one port. In the specific case of the Nostrea fronts, we found it just attached to the poles of uh, three vessels. With, uh, we sampled in a uh, papete port. But when we, we got samples again in 2018, we found uh, the two species in the two islands and uh, in more ports, in two ports uh, in the case of industrial forms, but already settled in the uh, harbors. Mm -hmm. So not, not just attached to holes, but uh, already in the, in the rocks and uh, uh, in different, uh, in, in many ports or in more ports and the percentage increased. The percentage over the total number of oysters sample. Oops. Okay. You see? 
the, the, the small volumetric percentages. So risks, uh, they are under expansion and uh, uh, we found uh, different haplotypes, different genetic variants uh, from the Nostrea fronts that may, may suggest uh, multiple introduction peaks in this case, which is quite, we, we, the oysters when analyzed are quite variable, which is not the case of Sacostrea populata. So the question is perhaps uh, could be in a future uh, be some problems for pair oysters in the horizon, we don't know, and uh, we fully know. But uh, they are there. Again, not, not to scare anybody, uh, the proportion is uh, high, relatively high among the total number of oysters that were back on them, but uh, it's not like enormous. They are not taking over the, the, all the rocks and all the ports. Remember that this data come from ports, not uh, from uh, other spaces. So they might be enclosed in the ports. We don't know. Um, other nice invasive species that we found in the stuff ports are Estiel applicata. Uh, impacts on shellfish agriculture, mainly by the predation of juveniles, but uh, also competition with adults. Uh, the manus proteus, that uh, small bug there. Uh, impacts on native intertidal species by competition, the alga, brown alga of Romania sinuosa from the Indian Ocean, that uh, with documented impacts on oyster beds, uh, like Harry and Bonnell's and the solarian filiformes uh, are red alga from the, uh, the Caraibs, the Caribbean, uh, that in may impact on native species, has been documented in the UK uh, by physical displacement. And the new challenges, and uh, I am sure that search will tell you many more challenges than in these ones. So they, they are, these are quite basic. Uh, First, uh, as he already told uh, us, create a baseline of current non-indigenous species in uh, French Polynesia, not only from the port, but the most spots uh, around French Polynesia. Uh, the risk assessment of the detect already detected means for a closer control of the most dangerous in case of expansion, it's urgent to plan a containment and eradication measure to identify the donor regions of the donor ports, including the whole port, the whole port, not only from the origin of a path, but also the intermediate points, to establish prevention measures, networking, networking, networking with those ports with the authorities of the different countries or and of the potential donor countries and uh, then risk assessment create future introductions as uh, Eric for example explained so well and also Holly in previous talks and uh, uh, from well and uh, then to remember and uh, we did it already in, in our region in Spain uh, remember that citizens can help in eradication, in routing controls, and in surveillance, especially in small islands and atolls where it's simply impossible to, to reach uh, with a normal budget of a country. Uh, and uh, as you uh, told us yesterday in your interesting talk about the DNA. Uh, also sailors can help a lot. Uh, everybody is around uh, because these sites uh, can collaborate once we have identified uh, the team bay. And uh, that's all. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sorry, I forgot to read it with uh, <laughs> being so quick that I forgot to acknowledge uh, uh, the, the, uh, thank you very, very much, uh, James, uh, Serge, Cecil, uh, Cynthia, for the organization and the 
fantastic opportunity to come here again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Donc, moi, il y a des choses donc euh, je suis maître de conférence, je me présente un peu parce que je ne euh, me connais pas forcément, donc je suis maître de conférence à l'université de Covid en française, au sein de l'UMR EIO, qui est l'écosystème insulaire océanien. Et euh, donc, ma, ma, spéc enfin, ma, ma spécialité, hein, ce sont les macro-algues, euh, et donc il faut euh, voir tout ce qui est diversité, l'écologie, tout ce qui est valorisation euh, des algues euh, plutôt dans l'Indo Pacifique. Euh, et donc là, on fait une présentation à deux voix aujourd'hui, donc avec euh, Xavier Cochon, euh, parce qu'en fait, euh, ce projet, donc euh, il est né de notre rencontre euh, à Nelson, à Cochon, en 2017. Ça avait été édité à euh, l'Institut à Cochon, en fait, et puis on avait discuté de, de tous les projets communs qu'on pouvait euh, mettre en place ensemble. On a beaucoup discuté parce que Xavier est très enthousiaste. Et, euh, et donc, en fait, on est vite arrivé à la conclusion, finalement, que euh, la thématique de la biosécurité marine devait être une de nos priorités, finalement. Parce que bah, la Nouvelle-Zélande, c'est une référence mondiale en termes de biosécurité euh, marine, donc euh, c'était euh, une évidence. Et puis, euh, l'Institut Cochrane, en fait, a développé des outils euh, très performants avec la DEN environnementale pour suivre et puis surtout pour prévenir, en fait, ces invasions. Donc ça nous paraissait euh, très pertinent hein, de collaborer sur cette question. Et puis bien sûr, euh, ben pour la Polynésie, c'est très important. La Polynésie, elle est concernée, hein, comme on a pu voir ce matin avec les modélisations de, de l'Éric. Hein. On est au centre du Pacifique. Et euh, surtout, c'est une des priorités aussi de notre gouvernement pour, le, pour 2030, hein, comme l'a rappelé Jean-Christophe Auprès euh, ce matin. Euh, donc voilà, et je voulais euh, aussi euh, remercier en fait euh, James plus particulièrement pour cette initiative de workshop qui j'espère permettra par la suite de, de consolider finalement euh, cette, euh, cette première collaboration qu'on avait eue en 2018 et j'espère que ça va marcher. Donc euh, d'abord donc, euh, un peu du contexte. Bon, vous avez vu cette carte moi quatre fois depuis ce matin, je suis désolée, hein, je suis même insiste. Euh, en fait, un des premiers vecteurs d'introduction, euh, c'est les transports euh, maritimes. Hein, euh, donc, euh, euh, Ellie a expliqué ce matin, mais je ne reviendrai pas là-dessus. Et ce qui est important, et ce qu'a ce qu relevé aussi euh, tout à l'heure Eva, c'est l'importance en fait, des, des selling boats, donc de, des bateaux de plaisance, et illustrés par euh, un de vos, de, 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 de vos travaux, euh, Art de Raïtan. 2015, qui à l'époque en fait, m'avait interpellé euh, quand je préparais mes cours euh, sur les arrêts biologiques. En fait, c'est des travaux euh, qui ont été dirigés par Serge Eva et qui sont super intéressants. Voilà. Ils avaient déjà détecté euh, la présence de cinq euh, espèces non américaines de l'eau jusqu'à un Moléa. Euh, et sur 26, donc ça fait 20% quand même des espèces non américaines, hein, ce qui est quand même non négligeable. Et ce qu'ils avaient mis euh, en évidence, c'est que la présence de ces espèces non indigènes était directement liée en fait, à la densité des, des bateaux euh, en présence dans les marinas adjacentes. Hein. Donc déjà, hein, voilà que bah, ces espèces non indigènes sont là, elles sont euh, naturalisées, et donc les risques d'invasion sont là, même si bien sûr hein, l'impact euh, sur l'environnement n'est pas observable pour l'instant, n'est pas présent, hein. c'est quand même des espèces non indigènes qui sont là, et euh, naturalisé. Et un autre point important, en fait, pour ce vecteur d'introduction aussi, c'est les risques importants euh, de ces transferts d'espèces vers les autres archipels, vers des îles, en fait, qui seraient peut-être moins résilientes à ces invasions. Ça, c'est un point important. Et euh, je voulais là faire un exemple avec Turbinaria en Natal. Turbinaria en Natal, c'est une espèce qui est native de l'archipel de la société. Hein. Et en fait, depuis les années 80, elle prolifère, comme vous le savez, hein, dans le lagon. Et en fait, du fait de cette prolifération, cette espèce, elle a réussi à étendre son aire de répartition géographique vers les Toronto. Donc bah, maintenant, on la retrouve dans de nombreux atolls. Hein, et souvent, je suis interpellée par les mères de, de ces atolls qui disent Mais qu'est-ce qu'on va faire avec cette espèce Donc elle est devenue invasive, en fait, dans les Toronto, hein, à partir des années 80. Et là, il y a deux vecteurs. Donc, un vecteur plutôt, on va dire, naturel, puisque c'est via les radeaux dérivants. Euh, ces grands radeaux que vous pouvez le voir à, à gauche là, mais aussi par des ballasts, euh, parce qu'on s'est rendu compte dans certains atolls qu'en fait la colonisation de cette espèce hein, euh, 
euh, se faisait tout d'abord tout autour des zones portuaires pour ensuite s'étendre euh, à euh, l'intégralité des Alpes. Donc, le deuxième vecteur d'introduction ici, c'est la confiture, euh, la pêche et euh, la garniture. Donc, euh, je vais juste illustrer par quelques exemples. Euh, un premier exemple avec la prolifération et l'invasion euh, par une anémone de mer euh, en, dans différentes algues terricoles et autres et tout. Hein, et ces invasions sont faites en fait. Elles étaient à partir des années euh, 1994 et en fait, ça a euh, envahi les différents atolls par euh, transfert successif de, de nacre. Hein. Et euh, c'est une espèce très proliférante, donc euh, ça a gêné, ça a eu un impact économique quand même euh, sur certaines fermes. Et par contre, euh, là je vous ai mis le nom d'espèce, mais euh, j ai, j ai pas, euh, apparemment c'est le genre Exceptasia, mais il n'y a pas vraiment d'études génétiques qui euh, confirment. Euh, cette, euh, ce nom d'espèce. Donc ça, ça a creusé. Ensuite, euh, un deuxième exemple donc, en pisciculture avec le Honda virus, lui qui est apparu dans les années euh, 2000, en fait, et euh, qui a entraîné des, certaines mortalités de différentes espèces de, de, de poissons. Et euh, une des hypothèses d'apparition de, de ce virus se fait euh, via l'introduction du loup tropical. Ça n'a pas été confirmé par les analyses génétiques. Par contre, récemment, ça, les données génétiques ont confirmé le transfert de ces virus entre espèces de poissons, ce qui, euh, là, est quand même un risque important hein, pour, euh, pour différentes espèces. Puis je finirai par l'exemple de Kema, que a cité euh, Eva aussi. Hein. C'est une euh, espèce, en fait, euh, qui est originaire de l'océan Indien et qui a été introduite un peu partout dans le monde pour des projets d'agriculture. Et euh, les algues, hein, vous savez, elles sont très à la mode en ce moment, tout le monde veut faire des cultures d'algues. Sauf qu'en fait, par exemple, à Hawaï, hein, c'est une espèce qui a proliféré au niveau des zones de culture et qui a entraîné des impacts très négatifs hein, sur les récifs coralliens, je sais que vous les écoutez, hein, certains récifs. Euh, et malheureusement, maintenant, elle est présente ici. Euh, on l'a retrouvée sur certains sites parce qu'en fait, elle a été introduite par un particulier qui, justement, fait des études de cette activité. Donc, euh, c'est une espèce à surveiller. Donc voilà, Donc, tout ça pour vous dire que les espèces euh, non indigènes, elles, elles sont là, certaines sont naturalisées, certaines présentent des caractères invasifs. Et ce qu'il y a en fait là, c'est le problème, c'est qu'il y a un manque cruel en fait, de connaissances sur ce qu'on appelait à la baseline, euh, des connaissances sur ces espèces, leur distribution, leur impact avéré potentiel et différents vecteurs, l'importance relative des différents vecteurs de production. Et euh, en fait, ce qui est moi principalement, en fait, au moins manque d'avancée de la biodiversité marine. Et notamment pour certains groupes euh, moins charismatiques que d'autres, on va dire euh, les, les algues, les micro-organismes. Donc à l'époque, hein, c'était euh, euh, sous l'égide de l'UICN, on avait déjà en fait, euh, réalisé euh, un état des lieux et des recommandations sur ces espèces exotiques envahissantes au niveau de l'outre-mer. Donc vous pouvez trouver ce rapport, il est euh, sur Internet. Et pour la Polynésie française, euh, on avait euh, listé 31 espèces euh, non indigènes, mais avec de, de, vraiment de grosses incertitudes sur euh, l'identification taxonomique de certaines, et puis sur les vecteurs d'introduction euh, des Polynésies. Et puis à côté, il hein, y a tous les travaux de, de Eva et de Serge Anquillon euh, euh, qui ont quand même euh, continué hein, le, le listing de tous ces LIS. Donc c'est dans ce contexte en fait, qu'on a créé le projet PLOMA, donc Biosécurité marine contre les espèces exotiques envahissantes en Polynésie française. Euh, donc euh, c'est un financement euh, du PF Control euh, CRIOP. Et l'idée là c'était de faire, euh, d'utiliser en fait les outils développés par les Néo-Zélandais, à Control, euh, dans les ports et marinas de Tahiti pour euh, faire un état des lieux euh, de euh, ces, ces espèces exotiques envahissantes. Et donc, je vais passer la parole à Xavier qui va vous expliquer euh, les résultats. Euh, pour les points de je vais passer à l'envers. Euh, dans la vérité, les gens ont l'air de se dire que c'est un peu plus compliqué. Si vous pouvez peut-être un peu plus de temps. Oui, merci beaucoup. I have for uh, this uh, nice introduction. Uh, yet yeah, it was, uh, you know, great. Obviously, a great uh, collaboration and a great opportunity uh, for uh, for me to scope a little bit further than just uh, small New Zealand that's out. 
uh, and to bring some of these capabilities that we developed over, over uh, now over 10 years uh, in the green value security space. Uh, and so maybe what differentiates us from traditional academics is that at the Cultural Institute we really work hand in hand with the government, central and regional government, and, and we tap into this new biotechnology, but we make sure that they're robust, uh, fit for purpose, uh, and absolutely valid in the biosecurity space. This is uh, really important. So I just want to highlight a couple of technologies that we use daily now in the lab. On the one hand, here on the left, uh, you have this uh, qPCR, but this one is a digital droplet PCR. So you're all familiar with qPCR because COVID, COVID test. Okay, so I don't have to explain that. This is a technique that is extremely sensitive, precise. You can measure things very accurately, and you can design some specific assays for a whole range of pathogens and invasive species. And we've done that. We look at pathogen in the aquaculture industry. We look at, you know, for example, Polenia was mentioned this morning uh, in oysters. Uh, we have also a panel of uh, accurate uh, techniques on a, on a range of invasive tests that we use uh, very effectively. And on the other hand, here to the right, you, of course, you have this hydro DNA sequencing technology that's fairly new, about 10 years now, and it's completely changing, revolutionizing the way we uh, conduct biodiversity survey at a large scale. And really what we can do here is, um, you know, audit across the tree of life, literally. You can take a single sample and then start looking across all of the taxonomical uh, components of the tree of life. Uh, you can also target specific groups uh, of interest, uh, but that really is uh, a fantastic tool for early screening. So it's not perfect. Uh, I talked about that uh, last night. Uh, that it's not a silver bullet. There's no perfect techniques ever. But it is a fantastic tool for early screening. And Anastasia will follow up in her talk about a fantastic test other tool that both allows the government to have direct automatic screening um, that can be then follow up and confirmed using uh, DDPCR, for example. So, uh, yeah, so I came here, I was very lucky to come here, invited by uh, UPF, but also uh, had the chance to interact with Serge at Field and, and his team and uh, visited Ifremen. By the way, this is not beers, you know, it's, uh, it's not the tree brasser, right? Uh, it's actually a fantastic uh, alga culture that they have at uh, Ifremen. Uh, that was a, a great exchange because we, we were about uh, able to look and understand the, the research gaps uh, that we have here in the, in the marine biosecurity space. For me, it was very informative. And we also had the superb chance to be uh, welcomed by the Port Autonome of Papete. And thank you, Han, again, for yesterday. It was amazing, the, the visit there. And Han uh, was awesome. He took us uh, in the field. Uh, because beyond this exchange, um, we also conducted a little survey, a baseline survey, that was made possible through uh, these different partners. Um, and we, we just briefly, I'm just going to go through just to show some results. So we targeted three sites and one control site. So it was all around the KMC coastline here. The control site was the Manava Hotels, fairly pristine uh, environment right there. Uh, we also went to Marina Taina, just a bit uh, of north, and then we uh, had access to the Papete Marina and the port of Papete in different locations around. And we essentially collected eDNA in both water, color, and biofilm and biotality samples and buoys and pontoons and things like that. We used this metabacoding, the sequencing uh, technique I mentioned, and targeted two different genes, uh, uh, one nuclear and one mitochondrial genes that targets pretty much all across the eukaryotes, um, eukaryotes and metasomes in particular. Um, so just really briefly, some results, but high level. Uh, here it shows, so we, we generated uh, you know, millions of sequence reads, but of these, about 15,000 were unique. We call them NP20 sequence variants. So these are just unique sequence reads um, that they do not approximate species. They are actually species that are a bit uh, higher. But you can use this information and then compare it to a very curated database that we actually assembled over the last 10 years that includes all of the, uh, the known uh, invasive organisms uh, international, but also the notifiable organisms in New Zealand. Uh, and through that, we could just simply use computer uh, programs to assign taxonomy to these. So about 4,000 
were assigned to the genus Lona, and about 2,000 were assigned uh, to the species Lona. You, you can see here a little bit of the diversity uh, dominated by patchwork boats, codata, uh, you know, dying flagellate, things like that. Uh, looking a little bit closer to the community structure, so this, uh, for those of you not uh, familiar with this sort of things, this simply shows the, the whole community structure in a two-dimensional -dimension, space. So uh, all it says is that when you have the cluster of little points here, that tells you that these are very close to each other in terms of community structure, and they're very distinct from these guys here. So what you can see is that the control sites, the, 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 the other marina and the marina and and the port in red were quite uh, nicely separated. So these communities were quite distinct in the biofauna uh, samples, but in the plankton also separated, but a little, a little more uh, kind of uh, diffused or kind of, kind of mingled. Uh, if you look at the richness, so it's, a, it's another way to look. It's not helping me anymore. Yeah, yeah, come back. That's, that's just the value of richness, so it's a, how diverse these communities are, and that's quite interesting. You can see that we, we realized that the richness is actually lowest at, uh, in the biofarming at the control site, and then it increased in the ports of Papete, you can see here, and it sort of had the reverse trends in the plankton, so more diverse at the control sites, and then it kind of drops down for various reasons. Um, and, then, and then that's the most interesting for you guys. Uh, we also look at matching those uh, non-indigenous species. We found about 50 of them that did not uh, have a known uh, Pacific origin. So they were either from Asia or Europe mostly, and that's represented about 40 <coughs> non-indigenous genera. You can see also if you compare, compare biofouling and plankton, so that was kind of an interesting thing. I would have expected a lot more matches on biofouling material. Uh, in fact, it was mostly matching in the plankton, in the water, um, and uh, also some dominate across. Uh, so the two most dominant one was Patrilis schlossera. This is uh, an acidian uh, that has allelopathic, allelopathic uh, chemical compounds or abilities, so that means it can produce compounds that can displace other species when they come out. So potentially have uh, um, yeah, quite a, a big risk our competing local diversity. And this is another one with a Cyporus octocata is originating from Caribbean or Atlantic. And it's quite, uh, it's a bryozoan like that's quite prolific on any substrate can actually, uh, you know, colonize also anti fouling material quite, uh, quite actively. And it's a big risk for aquaculture industry, for example. But a long story short is that we found a, a range of others, you know, mollusks, cytorizoan, but clearly, this is just uh, you know a, a baseline kind of a follow-up to the great work that Eva and Serge have been doing over the years. Um, but we don't know much. Like I think that's really the, the bottom line is that there's a lot more we have to do right now. So just to talk a, a little bit about outcomes and future perspectives. So obviously, we were lucky enough to publish this in an open access journal. So if you're interested to know more about this particular study, it's accessible here. And in terms of stock take, what I learned through this exchange where we ask questions around and where what are the values that you wish us to protect? And these are very clear. We, we heard it all morning. This is aquaculture, this is tourism, and this is fisheries, mostly. And what are the existing of future risks of these values? Well, the existing risks are clearly pathogens and invasive species. And they're coming and increasing a number. It's not going to stop, it's going to increase, and it's going to be aided by global climate change. And also by novel kind of vectors. Um, some are very clear now plastic, marine, marine plastic debris, and microplastics, we know are great carriers of pathogens and invasive species. So there's multiple threats uh, and problems here. So in my mind, there is really, when I came back from that trip, there were two things I thought we absolutely need to do immediately. So first, we need to develop a baseline knowledge to quantify these risks. Um, it, it, I realized that um, we don't really have a good grasp on, on how many invasive species are actually present here, when they arrived in, uh, in French Polynesia, and what is the frequency of, of these arrivals. So for me, it all starts with the baseline survey. You have to do this, and you have to do it regularly. If you ask me, we should be sequencing everything, everywhere, all of the time. <laughs> everything, everywhere, all of the time. You laugh, but it's gonna happen. 
So uh, we have to do that. If you calculate the loss of money that you have on the one end of the pipeline, well, we should invest in sequencing everything, everywhere, all of the time. <laughs> um, that would help us tremendously to um, you know, uh, assess the, the, those risks, of course. The networks, super fascinating. Eric talk and, and Oli, this morning, to me, this is the future. We need to be able to connect these sort of approaches and integrate with all sorts of other uh, environmental um, uh, factors. And EDNA, if we could be doing that, and I hope we can discuss that a little bit tomorrow. Local capability and infrastructure, that's key. You know, I mean, if you do that, you have to involve people from here, students from here, that can do the plan work, that can tap into these resources so already developed, and then uh, we can just uh, create a fantastic toolbox. Uh, we had this uh, scheme to do that. I mean, the, what we tried to do after the visit was to um, embark these PhD students here and do a co tutel you know, collaboration between New Zealand and here. Unfortunately, it didn't happen, but I'm, I'm really hoping that uh, we can make it through this time. And then the second point is really to develop a toolbox similar to the Marine Biosecurity Toolbox Program that has this incredible, developing this incredible tool set and capability to strengthen here, in that case, would be to strengthen IT by securing the future. So we need a surveillance program. I don't know in what shape or form. Uh, the courts uh, uh, autonome is uh, saying that they do uh, five yearly um, surveys. We need to do that to do that probably more regularly, and it could be done relatively simply uh, with some funding, of course. But in ports, marinas, and around key aquaculture setup, we need to manage the risk of vessels. Uh, and, and so on, and again, develop local capability and readiness plan. And these can be really adapted from what is already super well developed in New Zealand and Australia, for example. And of course, funding, 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 funding. <laughs> this is key. If you want to do anything of that, well, you need money. That's what we need to discuss as well in this uh, afternoon. Well, and Lulu. <laughs> Uh, especially in the region, 
uh, when new things are being introduced, especially things that could then potentially be invasive species, uh, the AI is a very important. Uh, it also has the South Pacific uh, bed, uh, which also has a flood collection. In terms of the regional context, uh, sustainable development is the best case. Uh, it covers a large area, uh, so there's a lot of limitations to uh, this, this effort in terms of trying to, to uh, address the uh, larger region. So uh, networking is very crucial, it's very important, and I'm very happy to be here with you all, uh, sharing this knowledge and hopefully establishing new connections and new linkages. Um, you know, the world is so small, people are still growing. As an example is Solomon's and Ronald, the internet empire. It's, it's, it's uh, calculated that they'll double by, they'll double the population, so uh, it's increasing as it is. Well. You have climate change as well. I hear there was a lot of talk on uh, climate change and its impact on invasive species. Indeed, it is something I think we need to uh, look into and then how we need to address this in terms of the sciences. Uh, as well as governments getting the buy from people who have the finances to assist us sustainably, uh, maintain this sustainable. Um, just a snapshot of the region in terms of resource ownership is 80% is, is customary uh, owned, and um, there's a lot of uh, issues in terms of uh, the uh, use utilization of the resources to. The increase uh, not only the GoFlo uh, the protocol, the expected sharing through the GoFlo protocol uh, under the CPD. Uh, there's also integration of global, digital, global, global policies as I mentioned on the CPD on the GoFlo protocol, um, and how these uh, global uh, conventions are actually operated at the national level is quite key. So uh, integrated things like people in the room right now they play a key role in communicating this knowledge, and I'm very happy that James is taking a uh, lead in this. In New Zealand, in terms of trying to merge the sciences and translate that into what policymakers can actually identify and uh, and, uh, and work on. Uh, so it's a spread of BTS around 300 countries, 110. I have about 75 percent of this is based in the largest island in the Tilevu, which is this is basically uh, why we we designed the project to be based at the main island uh, at the Tilevu. Uh, which is the Suwa. Uh, I think there's a lot to be said already in terms of the introduction of the species. We're all project for the fact that we're only concentrating on biofauna. We're not uh, actually working on palace water, although there was a lot of interest in, in palace water through the global farming project that's currently happening at the moment. There are focal points in a few countries. We are working with the focal point of Fiji uh, on, on, uh, on the uh, global farming project. It's basically Concentrating mainly on palace water management, and so I hear there is a lot of talk on, uh, on ship coverage. Um, there was a talk earlier on, on how monitor the, the discharge of the palace water. There is certain things. Our city authorities, which have actually uh, joined in, in that particular thing as well to, to track uh, palace water. Uh, a key note there in terms of the sources, I hear this aquarium, this aquaculture, this dedication of uh, canal boats that. Uh, into uh, pathways and and the new one was Pollution I was quite uh, interested in this, this new rock route and had to, to hear from your thoughts as well on how, because you know, there was some talk through this in terms of pollution, there are natural modes like spread in terms of uh, the ocean current in terms of natural disasters, but you know, on the other flip of the coin you have uh, pollution that's also deeper for this species, how do we manage this is quite uh, interesting. Um, so the basic objective of the project is to develop uh, uh, a high risk, um, non-invasive species and monitoring them uh, for Fiji. And the second one is to build a use uh, desktop early decision support, which is based on uh, eDNA and uh, GPS child uh, tagging uh, approaches. Um, mature if you're able to go to the website, you'll be able to watch the video. Uh, I'm not sure if you want to watch it right now, but maybe I'll uh, make sure you later. Uh, there's a video of the project on the uh, website. I'll just move on. That's basically the core of the thing. Okay, it's okay.
The team is divided into two. We have uh, our sub-administrative team which takes place in the USP. Uh, and we have our Belgian team which is based at Opis. Uh, I am uh, just part of the uh, village for ISD. And Pac-Man has five primary steps. One is close work with partners, stakeholders. The second is to establish the baseline data and develop the work and plan with the analysis. The third is to you know, train the local capacity and region uh, in order to utilize these uh, technologies with new learned lessons. The fourth is to standardize the information and you know, have it be reusable uh, in an open source manner. And the fifth was to build the decision support team that can be uh, utilized by managers uh, to make decisions and to develop approaches to manage potential invasive species, which are in our watches. I will talk on that later, but we actually have uh, identified four species from, from the literature from our uh, conversation with the uh, experts uh, that we have to consult. So just to break down in five steps. We work with the advisory partners, and a uh, uh, few of them are here. Uh, in the picture, I'm looking at a few. One is sitting in the auditorium today. Bill Davis, very much uh, appreciate your uh, presence and your assistance throughout the project. Um, and so they have been helping us in terms of how we want to use one's uh, the Drift's uh, database, in terms of how we want to manage um, uh, the data that we will be uh, producing uh, through the OPS, through the Geo, the Boost, the Geo form projects. Uh, and especially, it's a connection to other monitoring programs in the region, which is quite key. We, can't, we cannot be working uh, in silos and providing fish species. I'll talk about this later. This is a challenge for us uh, from a uh, highly terrestrial uh, uh, forum to bring in such an issue. Uh, you, need, uh, you need to be very uh, thorough with how you uh, push the, the challenges over. For recognition at the government level. Um, it's a close work with all these stakeholders as well. We were lucky enough to, to have Zoom and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the other softwares that we were, we were able to utilize. So we were able to move forward with a few deliverables in the recording, luckily. And um, we've signed a few uh, major agreements with the Biosecurity Authority in terms of developing the capacity on the EKA and the KPCI. Um, so the, the further left is, is we are quite fortunate enough during the phase of the Pac-Man project that it was in parallel with the National Invasive Species Project uh, funded by the Chapel facility and it's run by the Biosecurity Authority of Fiji. So in tandem with that, we are now contributing at the national level towards marine invasive species. So uh, I think that was uh, very fortunate for us. Uh, the second one, the second step is the establishment of baseline data uh, and the development of the monitoring plan. Um, very important is the core development of this through our uh, experts, through our consultancy, uh, consult consultations, professional stakeholders, other researchers, um, through the databases that we have uh, been looking into. And uh, we've come up with uh, four high-risk species. Uh, Eight of which is currently now in spreads, uh, non invasive species, 25 listing, and they have uh, recently come up with uh, as, a, as a rural field. So, uh, law consultations, PREP has actually moved forward as well to give this marine program. They have now have uh, uh, invasive species uh, watch list. Um, so, our monitoring plan was, was uh, uh, that began in 2021. Uh, and it's now into its trial phase. This year is a trial phase. Next year will be its implementation phase. So the trial phase is basically uh, we're trying out the methodologies. Uh, mind you, the technology is quite new in the PG. Um, and uh, uh, trying to implement things without uh, proper infrastructure and the, the, the capacity is quite uh, um, challenging. So that's something that we're doing. Um, the second uh, one is, is, as I mentioned, the trial phase, uh, it's the initial phase. So you see, we have on the right there the methodology that we are utilizing for the collection. We are only utilizing uh, water layer, water collections, uh, sediment plates, and uh, plankton nets. We are not 
are actually utilizing for connecting the settings for Work that's been done on a few of our uh, watch lists. They have uh, blocks that are already identified. We are actually applying these to help with our uh, targeted uh, approaches at the CQPCR. As usual, um, there's a lot of groundwork that's been happening. Uh, morphological taxonomy, there's uh, a lot of collections. Uh, we are also collecting our work with uh, the curation at the listed surfaces. We have a great collection. Uh, curator, as you see there, it's actually has been very cooperative with us, and this is something we are also uh, hoping to build in terms of capacity for the university. Whilst we have a very robust uh, barrier in terms of the curation of materials, in terms of how they can share samples, <coughs> we have treaties that actually allow them to share samples with labs, with universities. Our marine collection does not have that, so this is something we are trying to encourage, and the university just uh, conducted a GPF uh, workshop in terms of. Uh, you can utilize data, uh, the general uh, rules of thumb on how to analyze and handle a few way to standardize the information. Uh, preliminary results that we have at the moment, and I'm uh, really we have learned so much, we have learned so much this, uh, today from, from you all on the work we've done in Korea. Uh, mind you, we did uh, look around for information, although it might not have been far enough. We had originally identified only one um, uh, pilot study in, uh, I would say, it's, it's sort of precedence for the work that we were doing. It was conducted in, in, up here in Samoa uh, by Spur uh, in 2005, 2006, uh, by a gentleman by the name of um, Moses Kelly. And so the work he did was basically morphological based, it was not community based. So I'm very happy to see that uh, there's so much. Uh, leap and uh, progress in terms of this uh, uh, end. Um, we have conducted uh, three collections of residents and other people, uh, different local taxa we have identified, the dominant ones were wild boar, but uh, Brazil, Kodaka, Kodaka, sponges, uh, in barnacles and crabs, the mollusks and oysters. Uh, but mind you, none of them had biosolid effects. So the uh, I say this is because Pfizer threads have been effectively attached to those uh, structures. And most of the invasive species that we have in our watch list have a Pfizer thread. So uh, we are quite lucky and we are quite unfortunate in terms of the information, but we are lucky that PG does not, at the moment, through morphology, uh, seem to have some of these invasive species. Uh, but we hope we have more information as we uh, well, well further into DNA. So the third one is uh, training program, uh, training program for local scientists. Um, <coughs> well, we have uh, two training programs that we uh, plan for Fiji. One is uh, an expert training on the PCR. That's to be conducted in, in November this year. And the second one is uh, the one that we will be conducting next year. It's basically for uh, the managers, the people who make the decisions on the ground species. Uh, that's the uh, conducted through the ocean teacher who will have it. So uh, I would really suggest uh, for people who are also working on, in the marine environment, uh, you, you must know why you see have a, a registry called the Oceans Expert. In this registry you can actually find so many capacity building trainings that are happening that you actually can join in and you might have even have an opportunity to live uh, your activity the global uh, scale. And so this is something that we are utilizing at the moment. Fiji, luckily, you know, the South, South Pacific community has gained uh, access to this uh, global academy. SPC has now become the regional training center. So the, the, I'm mentioning this because how they operate is you do a training and it's reusable. There are ways for it to capture the training and reuse it. And you can actually re-edit it at a later point in time to reuse 
And so I think this is something important for terms of the sciences that is happening at the moment with this thesis. How can the permission be reusable? How can it be um, how can it evolve with time? This is the perfect platform to utilize. Uh, the fourth one is, is the seven is the reach of data management. We are actually building everything into what is called device limited pipeline that we will be delivering. That's our engineer, by the way. And uh, there's so many um, things that come into play. But we're quite happy that, uh, you know, our, for people who understand molecular analysis, you don't have to actually train your local stakeholders to bring in the raw data and to analyze them and then to align them. This the software that uh, we're trying to do, and I think uh, Otto probably has something similar, I forget with some of our colleagues from uh, Dickens, uh, something that can actually help with the uh, with analysis for non 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 uh, specialists. It gives them the sequence information of a personal button, it takes you through the whole iteration, and it gives you, you know, what's the uh, probability of that uh, taking over the environment. Finally, the last bit there is the decision support that we have to deliver. So basically, how the mathematics system works is you fill in the sequence, it runs the iterations, it does everything that uh, you would actually do if you were working on a uh, normal uh, backlog. If you're working with a better backlog, so many samples, so many sequences, so many data, so many base pairs to work with. But what we're doing is we're, we're passing it through a few databases, the rings, the ocean biodiversity information system it comes down to the detection, and I had some discussions on habitat suitability. We are passing it through a import manager, so that's a particular uh, uh, database that actually can help with habitat suitability modeling. So what we're, we're doing is what, uh, what we're doing is on actual actual collection we are also collecting plankton, uh, sample plates, water, as well as as well as the other parameters to assist with that habitat suitability modeling. Um, and in the end, we are trying to validate uh, things that, that we, we, we find uh, we included into this national um, uh, effort, uh, in which is a project that is currently running. Uh, as I am noticing, there's a lot of interest in mariculture. Um, this is a fine line that we've been also arguing about is how do you deal with the species that are economically sensitive, industrially important. Things like Perth and uh, you know, these things can be utilized for commercial purposes. So um, there's, uh, uh, I think, a highlight there on the trade implications of some of the work that we do and how we trade properly. Uh, if people want to buy like something, I guess there's a balance between the ecological, and I think the ecological stability is also to always take precedence over the economic. Uh, there's so many challenges, this is just a few. COVID, all of us in this uh, There's country uh, priorities uh, in infrastructure, shortages in terms of the work that we're doing, in terms of the analysis, uh, delays. We, we did face a lot of delays with procurements uh, for our uh, equipment procurement. There is an institutional survival uh, post COVID. Things do slow down in terms of funding. We did find that it's uh, quite. Uh, with uh, a lot during our experience, and this uh, structuring of institutional, uh, this institutional um, restructuring in terms of how things work within this as well. Uh, how we try to mitigate this is communicating uh, to all of the stakeholders, to buy, get the buy-in, and get them still uh, the involvement in the space. Um, keeping that trust, uh, I think, was very important to see that uh, they have your trust to keep them in the space so that we, we can re-engage them uh, for the back of the project. Uh, the other one was you know, managing finances, and you know, uh, global uh, events. And one that we found very interesting that uh, I think all of us can really identify is the change in the utilization of open ships and, and, and technology, um, virtual meetings, Social networking. So, our team, we have social networking that we work real time in terms of how uh, we want to protect our people on the ground. Um, so, how we've done this is to get the buy in. I think there was a lot of interest in seeing how we want to get the buy in. We've identified, we identified uh, the national 
frameworks that will be interacting with and we're able to uh, you know, generate interest from you know, the digital environment for how jumping in on our kind of country as well as well as vice versa. So we have a national biodiversity strategic action plan. There were a few areas that uh, address the national action plan. One is basically to target research for knowledge and species. One of the goals was to the database, so that is actually something uh, that we try to contribute towards uh, the data that we will be generating. The second area was the strength of national administration policy and the support for effective prevention management of diversity. So, as we speak of the PG is trying to finalize something known as the NISEP. So, national diversity is actually, and I know this is uh, about to, is actually something CDP. Uh, identifies as a framework that managers need to establish in country to, take, to manage uh, this species. I think that's one different countries might have, uh, might have established different ones. PG is looking into establishing this uh, in the uh, At the moment, the SPREP uh, currently mandated and uh, assisting the development of this uh, specific region. And uh, the last bit is uh, to strengthen the role of the Indigenous species task force. And I was speaking with a uh, colleague here uh, on, on this, the importance of establishing uh, um, uh, inter-departmental, inter-ministerial organization within the uh, regional countries that have a shared interest in diversity <coughs> and who can actually take up the, the initiative of Indigenous species uh, uh, management uh, in country. So PG has one for one as well. All of them have been done for a while. Uh, we are really trying to uh, catalyze the, the movement of this uh, body. Mm. And the last body is the uh, sum of our It's a particular interesting uh, uh, strategy to look into if you want to try to go into this particular scale. So, uh, as you see, we don't have a link. Again, to research and exchange and to see and uh, develop more for any Thank you. Mentor. Pia Rana. I'm from Cecilia Zaifa from Postman Institute. And uh, before I start, I want also to join you all these many things that everyone else expresses to the organizers of this amazing workshop. Uh, Serge and Cecile and Cynthia and James, who made it possible. So, we really appreciate you all being here, and I hope that you'll we'll have many fruitful discussions and uh, collaborations later on. So, I'm going to talk today about the Marine Best Security Toolbox, a research program that uh, uh, we run in New Zealand in cooperation with many partners. And uh, the aim and the mission of this program is to develop transformative tools to empower better marine biosecurity in New Zealand. But eventually, we would like to make these tools available to wider communities as well. And in the beginning, I would like to refer to this Swiss cheese pandemic defense model. Uh, you probably have seen it. It was like pretty popular during the COVID time to communicate the importance of different multiple layers of uh, defense steps to prevent the spread of the uh, very bad virus in our communities. But uh, so you probably all very well familiar with all those multiple steps that you are inquired to follow and uh, uh, like uh, basically um, support the uh, safety of our communities. But the important messages in this model are that no single intervention will be successful on its own as each has faults. And multiple layers improve success. So probably it resonates all of you now because you saw all those beautiful presentations and uh, um, Daniel's uh, presented uh, best security system, how it looks like. And uh, I can say that the same Swiss cheese model can be perfectly uh, applied to the marine biosecurity and biosecurity system in general. 
so we remember this, you know, the risks and those main pillars and stages that of life security system that presented, uh, that Daniel has presented earlier, uh, that we have exactly the same uh, strategy here. We need to build a multi-layered model that will ultimately reduce the risk of spread of these unwanted agents, unwanted uh, species to our waters. And uh, it can be split into this, you know, pre-border, in transit stage, and border and post-border stages. Uh, so pre-border and transit, they're mostly about this, you know, the international legislative initiative control and enforcement uh, that are uh, usually um, taken care of at the national or international levels. And the border and post-border stages, that is something uh, that is uh, happening more nationally or regionally. And that was the logic behind the Marine Mass Security Toolbox. To focus on these two stages, the border and post-border, and look at those main layers of protection or defense in the best security system. And how actually we can improve those different layers of protection to make it more efficient and also to harness the potential of all the new available technologies in the model uh, world. And the, the research program is really like a unique in the sense that it, uh, it is a big collaboration between 14 partners, official partners, and I think many more, we include also like associate partners and stakeholders. <coughs> and it includes the uh, New Zealand and international scientific organizations and universities, uh, regional uh, government, uh, national government, uh, educators, and uh, also the indigenous, uh, indigenous organizations. So this makes it like really successful in terms of the, the methods that, and the tools that we have created uh, that are fit for purpose and they are designed to be fit for purpose from the very beginning. And hopefully the, that will also facilitate the uptake of these tools at the end of the program. So I'll briefly go through all those different work packages or work streams. Uh, some of them have been presented already. Oli and Eric did a great job talking about them. And I'll focus more on the detect component that I'm mostly in charge of. But I'll briefly present the others as well. So the first work stream is Protect. And it aims at the innovative anti fouling and green engineering solutions for best degree coastal hazards. So the idea behind is that you know these hotspots of uh, incursions, the ports and marinas that are heavily modified now and are full of uh, artificially engineered uh, structures that attract those features and makes them the local pools of further threat. So we need to uh, to make sure that these local pools of the spread, uh, they are the, the risk spreading from the from these hotspots, it is efficient, efficiently mitigated, and this can be done by keeping these structures clean first of all, and uh, by also enhancing the natural biodiversity in those areas. So, how to keep these structures clean? Uh, we look into novel engineering solutions. Uh, for example, like the bubble streams technology used here. So it's an uh, environmentally friendly technology that helps to protect the uh, pillars and the, the pontoons and also idle boats from being fought while they are in those marinas or ports. This can be also combined with the application of biocontrol agents like uh, natural uh, grazers and uh, predators that could control the existing biopolling populations. Uh, finally, we are, we are looking also into the novel anti fouling uh, approaches that are inspired by nature, uh, like creating novel techniques of uh, generating functionalized surfaces that are similar to naturally resistant, uh, to, to surfaces that are naturally resistant to uh, biopolling, for example, like shark skin or dark feathers that do not fall. 
So we are trying to mimic these structures at the really nano micro scale level and create these uh, functionalized surfaces that can be applied in um, newly eco engineering structures in ports and marinas or even for covering boats or any other artificial structures in those ports. And in, terms, in those places where keeping uh, the surfaces completely clean or biodegradable is impossible, the alternative solution could be just to improve the natural biodiversity by enhancing the species that would want to be there, there and thus uh, creating unfavorable conditions for unwanted organisms. And this is done by generating new uh, eco-engineering eco services and structures that would attract specifically those species that we want and thus prevent accumulation of unwanted tests. So they detect. As Daniel said, that it's really critical that we detect uh, new incursions as early as possible. Because when um, it is late, when the species starts spreading in the ocean, basically nothing can be done or it will be super expensive. So detection is the, the uh, very important step in this defense chain. And for these four packages, we uh, specifically look into the molecular tools for improving the uh, toolkit for, for uh, surveillance in the uh, coastal ecosystems. And I'll talk about it uh, later in more details. Managing response, oh. wow. Managing response, so basically it is Sorry. It is about uh, understanding how this species spread, how they come to, what are the pathways, what are the vectors, how they uh, come to New Zealand and how they spread around. And this is what Oli and Eric presented, using those integrated marine coupling models to quantify the spread and also help to optimize the management, to understand what are the important nodes, where should the management be focused, and also to um, predict the future changes in terms of uh, connectivity between those nodes. So I'm not going to talk about it because it was beautifully presented before. And finally, the economics and decision support tools. So this is a really important component because like, what has been developed or is being developed in all these three other work packages, uh, it is like a range of different uh, tools and approaches that can be used in different combinations for different situations. And for the managers, it is really important to understand what is the best combination for a specific occasion. And we employ here the knowledge from the economics to uh, evaluate what, are, what is the best economically feasible and economically suitable combination of those things that should be taken into into account for a particular case or a particular uh, region. And decision support tool tools, these are basically uh, a suite of different apps and different protocols that we uh, develop in the course of the program that will be ready to be given a weight to the end users and uh, ready to be applied in the routine communication in the future. So, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the detect component. And again, as, as it was said uh, today already, you know, in the marine environment, it's really difficult to visually see when something is new there, when some, something that shouldn't be there appears. And in uh, island nations like New Zealand, like French Polynesia, that are support, uh, surrounded by uh, vast uh, aquatic uh, ecosystems, it's really, really difficult to dive, snorkel, send a diver, and look under each of those boats, into each of the, the, you know, under each of the rocks, and detect those tests that might be just, you know, the very initial step of the uh, arrival. So many of those new hammers remain invisible until it is too late to do anything about them. And again, that's why detection is really, and surveillance is really important here. So we employ the tools called environmental DNA, and uh, we have heard about it already a few times today. So just to remind you, this is the method that captures the fingerprints 
the genetic fingerprints that all the species and also us bring to the environment. So basically, it's like environmental forensics. Or I, I heard actually a new, um, really, really cool term for that, liquid biopsy. So it's something that you can detect, like basically take a small sample of, of, from the environment, like of water, of sediments, of biofuel. You can extract this information, and then you can um, decode the genetic sequences that you find in this sample, and then compare these sequences to the existing database, and say what is the biodiversity that was in that place in that time when you sampled, or like recently. It is a very effective tool, and it is uh, applied widely now, not only in marine or aquatic ecosystems for biodiversity assessments. It is used in terrestrial ecosystems, even for like air samples. And uh, in marine based security, it has multiple applications as well. So it can be used for early, early detections of target pests, uh, like pre water control and enforcement, for pathway risk assessments, hub monitoring, and so on. But unfortunately, we do not see that it is widely implemented. It is like uh, there are many case studies showing that yes, it is a good tool. Yes, it is. Uh, it has a lot of potential, but not yet it is uptaken really widely for routine surveillance. What is the reason? So, I would like to share this result of the recent survey that was run by the newly established Southern eDNA Society, the New Zealand Australian eDNA Society. And uh, the idea was to capture like, the current perspectives and issues of the wider uh, community of DNA users. So it was, um, uh, the survey was answered by more than 100 people, <coughs> and included not only researchers, but a good portion of the respondents, they were actually end users. And as you can see that for this question, what are the key non-technical barriers you experience for routine adoption of DNA? based methods, the most popular answer was implementation is too complex or implementation pathway is unclear. So basically, what does it say? That people like know about this method, they are keen to use it, but it's not quite clear how actually and what is the best way to, to use it for the routine application. So we in the marine based security toolbox, our team we focused at trying to answer these questions. And uh, uh, we specifically looked at the questions that we usually receive from the end users, you know, when they say, okay, so how do we apply it? Where do we sample? When do we sample? And that was our focus to look at all those questions and try to empirically and very systematically answer them as much as we can. So we can provide these answers that are scientifically robust and underpinned by really like very robust science. science. So the first question, how to sample? And we look in different, into different sampling techniques. Like if it is both collecting concentrated sample using the planting net, or it is enough to have a syringe of water or a bucket of water to filtrate, uh, is it good to use these small uh, like devices like this self-preserving filter, for example, filter pack? Does it preserve DNA uh, well enough? Yes, it does. And by the way, the concentration of samples, yes, it looks that much better than taking the syringe or the bucket of water sample. Uh, then um, improving the sampling devices, like uh, if you attended yesterday's talk by Xavier and he showed this uh, beautiful device called uh, Prison Skip Net that allows you to sample at high speeds from the boat and concentrate samples like over uh, hundreds of meters, basically improving the probability of detect detecting rare species, and even further to skip the filtration step by inserting the filter in the device so we can concentrate the DNA while we are sampling. Where to sample and when to sample? Another question. So DNA, if we, if we are talking about water samples, it is like really spread and distributed and it moves into water and you know if you capture it here it doesn't mean that the species is currently present in the, this location can be just drifted from uh, certain, for a certain um, distance. 
So the question where and when the sample is really important, specifically in those locations where you have a very strong hydrodynamics or tidal conditions. And so to, to help to answer these questions, we developed the uh, hydrodynamic models that look, look at the distribution and the spread of DNA, also accounting for the DNA ecology, the uh, fate of DNA and degradation of DNA in different conditions. And to uh, parameterize these models, uh, we also run experiments to understand actually better what is the degradation rate of DNA in marine environment and also RNA. So these are colorful bags that are actually a, a very cool uh, experiment that was designed by our PC student and we use dialysis bags for that. So the dialysis bags, they are unique in terms of that they are semi permeable they can um, let the water and the water molecules flow through the surface, but they do not allow the larger molecules like DNA and RNA to enter past the, the, the bag. So uh, we inserted these bags into the marina and actually observed over time how the concentration of the target DNA and RNA changed. So we can build a degradation model that then can be used in this hydrodynamic uh, model to, to predict the spread of DNA molecules of a larger uh, spatial menus. Um, okay, then after that, you collected the sample, you defined where and how you wanted the sample and collected the uh, sample, sample properly, but then you need to analyze that. And here our focus is to actually simplify the, the workflow. So the analysis can be brought closer to the end goals. And it's not only the privilege of us, molecular scientists, to, to run this analysis in the uh, laboratory, but also anyone basically can do that. And this will help to employ citizen science and involve them uh, more actively into the surveillance programs. Like as Alice presented today, uh, the importance of engagement of citizens and building up actually this, you know, the team of five million of New Zealanders to help uh, in the marine the security surveillance. So for example, this cool device that you see on the left, uh, it is called PDPS, pretty damn quick extractor. <laughs> so it is, it is available actually, you can, you can uh, buy it from, from the producer. And the pen uh, close to it is just for the seeing the scale, so it's really a small device. And it can run 16 samples, right? 16 samples uh, at once to extract effectively genomic quality DNA and RNA in 20 minutes from the environmental sample or a tissue sample. 12 volts battery. It runs from the 12 volts battery, so we can run it, we can use it in the field basically. So we are testing and adjusting the protocols for this type, these and other types of devi devices. Mm -hmm. uh, then we combine it with other uh, molecular methods and protocols. For example, we de designed this uh, RPA test for the Mediterranean platform, the famous uh, New Zealand invader. Basically, it is, you, you see these strips, it's the la lateral uh, flow strips that are similar to, the, the principle is similar to the Greek COVID test that you can basically run in handfold on the patient, like a body temperature, and in 20 minutes again you get the answer. And then we also run the trials of these uh, protocols with the citizens, like non-professional scientists, to uh, prove that the protocols are understandable and that the tests, that the methods are usable by non-professional scientists. And finally, how to interpret the data and inform management. And uh, if you have seen the metabolic data, uh, you probably know how overwhelming it is. It's like a huge amount of information, just with millions and millions of sequence reads, and without specific uh, bioinformatical knowledge and uh, knowledge of uh, some analytical tools, it's really hard for people to get any sense of out of this data. So we developed this festival tool that actually allows you to upload uh, the, the almost raw uh, data sets into the online uh, uh, engine. And if you 
we have it against a well created um, database of non indigenous species, marine non indigenous species of New Zealand, and also modifiable and unwanted organisms. And it will produce immediately. Um, the results of the matches that you can investigate further. You can look into the reference sequence, how robust it is, how trustable it is. You can generate a uh, phylogenetic tree to see how well do they match. And also, it highlights if you get any of the notifiable organisms. So, this tool is already available online, and we are actually using it for our own purposes for research because it simplifies our life as well. Because we can just any of the produced metal recording done something we run against this tool. And we would like, would like to encourage any metal recording data producers in New Zealand to use it as a, a good practice tool for screening their data sets, even if they're not interested in the biosecurity. But they might uh, unintentionally detect some uh, notifiable organisms. And this would be also an additional help, an additional engine to inform managers about the presence of those species that are otherwise might not be detected promptly. And to do so, to inform the managers, we're actually currently developing the extension for this Pestilent tool that is called Preliminary Expat. And the idea is that after you have generated this match table, you'll be prompted to submit the report into the expat tool. And it will, be, it will gather this information per species, per time period, also per uh, different uh, marker types uh, used, and also you can add information like the, how the sample was collected, who is the collector, and also how the sample was verified. If it is not verified sample, if you run some additional uh, species, species specific assays, or if you verify by the visual detection. And uh, ideally, what we would like to see that it's like a like a fake mock data set. It doesn't like, represent the actual uh, picture, but ideally, we would like to see that we will have the accumulation over time of these reports that also might inform managers about the current situation or in uh, the in non-indigenous species biodiversity, but also how it changes through time. And this tool will be searchable and you can use different fingers to, uh, to find the information on the species of interest or the region of interest. And of course, all this would be impossible without this extended uh, team of amazing people. So I think it's not the whole team actually, there are now close to 50 people including uh, students, and it's really a, a great team to work together, and I want to thank them all, and for all the support and great vibes that we have in the program. And finally, yeah, if you want to find more, or want to know anything about uh, what's going on and the tools being developed, please visit our website or contact Ori or I, and we'll happily share more information with you. And I would like to finish with the Hoka Toki that was gifted by our Maori partner, Dr. Karakiki uh, uh, TV Trust. Look through the eyes of the Ongokwe, that is uh, a hammerhead shark, observing in all directions. And if you remember this Swiss cheese model, you know that we need to have multiple layers of protection, but we also need to be really vigilant and observe all directions of our precious marine ecosystems. Thank you.